Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Such an honor to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of what, uh, similar to what Victor's been doing with a little bit less care and love, but um, for a popular audience. So um, applying, trying to figure out how to translate evidence um, a little bit more conscientiously in journalism. And for those of you, how many people know what Vox is? So it's a digital, so that's not so bad, nerds in the room for sure. Um, so it's a digital news site. Um, so it started online two years ago and kind of like an economist or Time magazine for the 21st century. So a little bit more context analysis, pulling back from the news. But first, um, I wanted to pay tribute to some of the people in the room, my patron saints of evidence-based thinking, and just say how honored I am to share the stage with some of them today and to be among all of you and to just acknowledge how many of the things that I'm going to talk about today were so heavily influenced by their writing or by them enduring conversations with me and um, reading their work. And I wanted to tell you um, a story about how I became interested in evidence-based medicine. So it's kind of silly. It started with a bus ride. Um, I was going to report on a story. I was um, a health reporter in Canada and going to report a story at McMaster University, which many of you will recognize as um, you know, the, the, some of the fathers of evidence-based medicine came from there, Sackett, Guyad, and Haynes. A couple of them are on this slide. And um, so I was taking this, getting on the bus to, to just do a run-of-the-mill health story there. And I ended up being seated um, next to the gentleman in the bottom left corner of the slide, Stephen Hoffman, who was then working in the biostatistics and epidemiology department there with um, Guyad and Haynes. And we started to chat about health journalism. <laughs> and inevitably, I'm sure you, many of you have had this I have already had this conversation with several people here, like, why is health journalism so, um, so much rubbish in health reporting? And how could it be that you, know, you report at very esteemed publications, coffee's good for you one day, it's bad the next. You completely ignore research evidence, miracle cures, like all the things that I'm sure many of you in the room absolutely hate. And so we started to talk about it and pretty quickly realized we were coming at things from these two very different cultures with um, different pressures and needs. And, um, and that kind of started this long-term collaboration, which has continued today. And through him, um, I was lucky enough to meet some of the others in the, in the department and eventually Victor as well. And what I think they taught me that really has resonated and kind of permeated through my work is that we're living in this time of immense you know, <laughs> potential and unprecedented knowledge generation. And you know, you were doing that people in the evidence-based community have been working so hard to do things like um, the tools that Victor was talking about, um, like systematic reviews to make sense of research evidence and to make, you know, try to make decisions based on the totality of research evidence. And yet in journalism, we're basically pretending like that never happened. We're still doing this single study reporting. And um, are we OK? People say they can't hear at the back. OK. Can you hold that? Oh, yeah, your for sure. Sorry, the microphone's no here. No worries. OK, holding two things. I think I can handle it. Um, <laughs> so so um, yeah, so basically, we're just pretending like this, this whole thing never happened. And that really just. That disjoint between the conversations that were happening in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster and then what we were doing in the newsroom was embarrassing and kind of just um, really opened my eyes to, to how things work. So this is, how do I play something? I think I can do this. So I think this is a good summary of the status quo. It's John Oliver. OK. Science. The thing we love and respect so much, we only allow scientists to be portrayed by the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Nicolas Cage, and Al Pacino. That <laughs> is how much we respect them and the complexity of the work they do. Science is constantly producing new studies, as you would know if you've ever watched TV. A new study shows how sugar might fuel the growth of cancer. A new study shows late night snacking could damage the part of your brain that creates and stores memories. A new study finds pizza is the most addictive food in America. A new study suggests hugging your dog is bad for your dog. And drinking a glass of red wine is just as good as spending an hour. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so how do I get out of here? So I think, yeah, many of us um, feel outraged by this. Like, how is this even allowed to happen? And, um, sorry, too many tools here. And I think, you know, I know, again, many researchers think a lot about dissemination of their research into journals, but I think the media play this massive role in reaching people. And, you know, I was talking to a researcher today at the break who was saying that he's so upset that he does, he spends his evenings and weekends doing this, these really rigorous systematic reviews and high quality trials. And yet we in the media overwhelmingly report on these shitty observational studies and like, you know, confused correlation and causation. And it's not just um, reaching patients. It's also, I've talked to health ministers of sizable countries who say that they rely on The Economist and The New York Times to keep up to date on research. And if we're getting it wrong or we're kind of completely, um, you know, not disseminating all the brilliant knowledge you're accumulating, then I think it's just a really uh, missed opportunity. And so um, I think, yeah, the, the, there's this gap between what's known in research and then how we're using it in the media and, and then how it reaches these very important channels, policymakers, practitioners, and patients. And I have to say, and I know the, the enlightened people in this room will probably agree, it's not all our fault. It's also, th this is this great um, BMJ paper. It's a visualization from nature, but it was a study in the BMJ. And what you see is um, the, the green line is words like amazing, assuring, astonishing in journals. And you see a ninefold increase between 1974 and 2014. And as you can see, th there was only a slight increase in the use of negative language. So... This is um, a tricky thing to wade through as a reporter, but I think, you know, in journalism, we're basically where you were in the 1990s in evidence-based medicine. We're doing the, you know, taking um, the Dr. Spock, like um, using expert opinion or single studies to inform the kind of um, advice we end up, or the kind of information we give to, to our readers. And I think that if we can find ways to do all the amazing things you've been doing for doctors and for patients, to do them for journalism or to work with journalists, um, I think this is really the frontier of an, a, a big opportunity for um, the evidence-based medicine community. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about one small thing we're doing at Vox. It's a little experiment. Um, and basically, it's trying to do the opposite of what John Oliver um, was describing this and what I've been describing throughout. So it's trying to pull back and say, what do the systematic reviews, um, high quality systematic reviews on a subject like e-cigarettes and health or weight loss and exercise or dietary fat, what, what do they say and where is the best evidence and can we talk to researchers about um, their research and not only tell people about what's known about something but also why, why do we know that and you know, what are the big unknowns? And so um, I'll show you some examples, if I can flip through here. So yeah, one big thing we do is communicating uncertainties and limitations in the research. So in this um, piece on e-cigarettes, very quickly I learned that there were only two randomized trials published on e-cigarettes at the time, and that most of the research was published by what, okay, now I'm going to get all the vaping, no one tweet this, because the vaping people on Twitter are vicious. And, um, <laughs> And um, it will absolutely inundate my feed. But um, basically, so very few high quality um, studies, and then many of them were funded by the industry. And there was just, you know, no, th there have been no long term studies on the health effects of e cigarettes. So even though um, they, they look a lot better than the worst possible thing you can do for your health, smoking, um, there's a lot that's not known about them. So we, we tried to communicate that in our. Um, story about um, e-cigarettes. And then we did a piece on dietary fat. And so a big challenge for journalists is trying to find the stories and the studies and trying to make the research evidence interesting so that people actually read what you're writing. Um, and one thing there was talking about the flip-flopping that had happened around dietary fat and why that had happened. And in the U.S. context, um, a lot of it had to do with you know, the USDA is the USDA's involvement in the dietary guidelines and not wanting to tell people to basically eat less meat. And so the message became eat less fat. And even though we knew quite, or the researchers knew very early on that it was different types of fat that were affecting the body in different ways. 
And so that, that became part of the story there. Um, and then we do this on these, so the, actually this is something that was very much inspired by the Co Co Cochrane Club, but it's not the collaboration anymore, but by the Cochrane Group, the plain language summaries and then the BMJ, um, BMJ does this fantastic, um, you know, what is this ad little box in, in studies. And so when we were doing these long stories about basically these, yeah, stories of evidence, um, we decided to add this little box, which we've now made visual about what we know, what we don't know, and what this means for you, and then what it means for policy. So here, um, again, it's weight loss and exercise, and you know, one of the big messages there was exercise is fantastic for so many things, but the weight of the best research says that it's really not that great for weight loss. And so what does that mean for you? It means exercise, just don't expect to lose weight for it. And then in policy, in the policy debate, we often talk about you know, physical activity and food, like we give them equal weight when we, when we talk about obesity, but really we should be focusing on the food part of it and not the physical activity part as much. So, and then, yeah, we're, we're always trying, so one big thing is at a digital news site, we get a lot of readers, we can very, very distressingly fine detail track where people are reading and how they're reading and how they're coming to us. And so making things, especially for readers on mobile, always finding ways to make things visual um, and communicate evidence in a visual way is um, a big emphasis. And I have to say for journal editors in the room, um, the one complaint I always get for, from our, um, our visuals team is that the graphs in journals just aren't very good, basically. <laughs> So if, um, yeah, they, they often don't tell a story or they're confusing, um, so making those clear would be great. But this is an example of an interactive um, based on um, Raj Chetty's data from, that just came out um, in JAMA. He's a researcher at Stanford. And it allowed people to see, so, so he had this data on this, so, this gradient in longevity based on where you live and your um, socioeconomic status. And so this allowed people to, we built an interactive, you could plug in some things about yourself, your sex, where you live, and you could see how long the poorest live in your community and how long the wealthiest live, and then kind of see where you fall on the gradient. So we're always looking for those opportunities. Okay, this is another video and I'm just not gonna bother, but basically um, another big thing we're thinking about is, in terms of reaching readers is, you know, we're seeing, so we started as a website two years ago, but we're seeing very quickly that a lot, you know, vast, disproportionate, you know, majority of people are coming to us through channels like YouTube. Snapchat is huge. How many people know what Snapchat is or use it? So I barely understand it, but it's like become the most important part of our business, basically. And, um, and what's been really interesting is taking these nerdy stories about evidence and translating them into a platform like Snapchat, which is essentially where 14-year-olds um, go to send sext each other with <laughs> nude photos. But it also has this Discover channel um, where news outlets have been lucky enough to experiment with how to reach people there. And so we were invited to, yeah, it's kind of hard to talk about if we don't know what it is, but basically um, it's, a new, it's a new social media tool and we're, we were on that, and we're trying to f translate our stories to that. And so we did one on exercise. We've done things on HIV. And um, you reach this completely different audience and on a different platform. But that's something we're, that I'm thinking about a lot. So not only communicating evidence in an accurate way, but also how to do it in formats that make sense for where readers actually are. Um, and then... And then, I, so I want to talk about some of the challenges um, for journalists using better evidence. So as you can tell by this little mouse trap, clickbait. Um, so again, digital news environment, there is massive pressure to build an audience and to get people reading your stories. Um, and, you know, so, so we're not, again, we're not just thinking about how to, you know, be really accurate and how to, um, yeah, kind of, be very concise about a systematic review, let's say, we're thinking about how do you package this in a way that people are actually gonna read, and that affects the kinds of things we cover for sure, and um, makes covering some other issues that might be really important um, an extra challenge. We're also under, 
Just a big time crunch. So the time horizons that I'm working on are you often like a day, two days, three. Sometimes the the kinds of articles I just talked about, these show me the evidence series, we're doing those over several weeks or even a month. Like there's longer time horizons, but it's still pretty crunched, I think, compared to the culture that you might be used to in in research. And then I think there's still not a lot of, as I was alluding to, we're in the 1990s when it comes to thinking about research in newsrooms. Um, I don't think, I, I don't, I've talked to journalists who say if it's published in a journal, then it must be science. And it's the scientist's problem to like sort that out. If it's a published study and it's coming at me, then it's science and I can write about it. So I think there's maybe not as much um, sensitization to different strengths of different types of evidence. And also even, I'm not sure people know that systematic reviews exist. I don't have any evidence to back that up, but I, I, I think health and science reporters probably do, but a lot of the reporters who are covering research you know, might, might be doing a health story in the morning and going to the courts in the afternoon to cover another story. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going with the, if it's published in a journal, it's science. And then I think one big barrier is even if you are sensitized to different qual types of yeah, quality of research, if you do have the time to look through it, finding the evidence actually isn't that easy. So as a journalist, we have subscriptions, um, media subscriptions to different journals. Um, I've been lucky enough through yeah, collaborations with universities to have institutional access. But I know many, many journalists rely on sites like Sci-Hub. Do you know, does everyone know what this is? So it's um, this researcher uh, from Kazakhstan who basically hacked together all these library passwords and you just put in a URL and it brings you um, to a site and Elsevier is constantly waging war against her and she's incredible, but a lot of people rely. And I've talked to, quite frankly, doctors and researchers who also rely on Sci-Hub. So I don't really have many answers here and I'd love to talk with all of you about um, how we can bridge the research to reporting gap. But some suggestions, I think, um, you know, meet more reporters on buses and lecture them about evidence-based medicine, that seemed to work. But more engagement, I think, between the two camps and discussing things and reaching across. I was talking to a researcher at the London School of Medicine and Tropical Hygiene last week, and he was saying early in his career, he really um, made an effort to be published in places like The Guardian and The Times, and, and now he's going to like The Daily Mail and these other places that maybe aren't as you know, prestigious among his peers, but where he really feels like he can have an impact. And I think that, that's a really interesting to think about. I think, am I almost out of time? There's not, okay, not a lot of accountability. So, you know, why, why is it that health reporters can still do the cancer is good for you one day, or coffee is good for you one day, or, and the next day it causes cancer? Like, that's kind of ridiculous. And I wish that, you know, some of you in the room would hold us to account or hold, you know, tell our editors when we're really screwing up. And then figuring out tools, you know, you have the Cochrane Library, you have up to date these different tools that researchers, I've, I've already learned about like five more that I didn't know existed, um, that researchers and doctors are using. Can we, you know, reach out to the media to use those or invent different tools that the media can use? Um, and then the problem of, yeah, press. So, so as you know, there's a lot of evidence that whatever is in press releases trickles directly into the media. So finding ways to make that more evidence-based, and Ben has done awesome work and had great suggestions around that, and actually many of these other things. Um, and then education, education, education. Knowledge is power, as Victor, Victor was skeptical about that. But I think education is actually um, really important, especially for reporters who are gonna be covering this stuff all the time. Um, and yeah, we're looking, for, looking at building the kind of health and science stuff we're doing out, so if you have ideas, and you want to contribute, if you want to continue the conversation, please definitely reach out, and I look forward to your questions later.